That's my synagogue, Young Israel of Hollywood, Fort Lauderdale. We have lots of members, people of all ages, and a full schedule of activities in any given week. We have a few rabbis, and they're the greatest. Sometimes we even have rabbis who visit for the weekend as scholars and residents. But then along came this virus, and with it, self-isolation, quarantine, and for some reason, a major toilet paper shortage. But I digress. So we tried to move all of our classes and activities online, and people seemed to like it. But I was thinking, what if we got some of our rabbis together, perhaps even the occasional guest, once a week, just to shoot the breeze and maybe joke around a little. I'm Avi Fryer, and this is Rabbis in Quarantine Getting Coffee. So, uh, how's everybody doing? Pesach is over. It flew by. It really did fly by. How, let's hear some, some retrospective on Pesach. How is everybody's Pesach? I, I know I have a, a few little axes to grind, but I want to hear, uh, hear what the rabbis have to say. Well, you know, okay. I'll say that, uh, was shorter this year. You know, uh, less people, just the kids. It was very quick, and normally you go to shul the next day, and you know, there's this thing like you feel self-conscious about how late your seder went, and everyone's arguing, you know, who's late, who went later. But this year, you know, it could have been a short seder, and no one would know. You didn't have to uh, go to shul the next day and be, sh you know, seder shamed by the guy whose seder went till uh, three in the morning. So that was a nice thing. That's right. Well, and and you'd have no <laughs> way of knowing whatsoever. How about uh, Rabbi Davis? I know at your seder. You're not allowed to ask a lot of questions until the meal. Is that is that the way it works? Divrei Torah is best over chicken soup. That's been my motto for centuries. Because and people it, it, it works. People are it hungry, works. which which brings me to, I I use I use the art scroll art scroll machzer. Everybody, do you gentlemen do you use the art scroll machzer? No. We call out we call out pages in a couple of different machzer. We do now. You're not supposed to just, I don't want to poskin for anyone. The rabbis are here, but you're not, you're not supposed to talk between Yishtabach and the end of Shimon Esrei, right? Right. Would that, that would be correct. So is it a problem that I sit there, they have all these extra Yotzrot that Arts Girl likes to put in, all the pages in gray, and I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm in, I'm, I'm in Berchot Shema and I'm going, no, no. No, no, no. Is that a problem? No. no. Ron Soloveitchik did the same thing. <laughs> oh, okay. And, and they, they write at the top, some congregations say this. And I really feel like what they wanted to say was, oh, you think you're religious? Well, some congregations say this tongue twister of a yotzer, and they don't eat lunch until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So you have your little fun there. That's really what I feel like the Rabbi Scroll wanted to say. Rabbi Davis, what's your view? Yeah, you know, you put away Rabbi Scroll, take a vacation from him, go back to where your parents or grandparents did the Seder. It's a delightful thing, but I want to tell you a secret. The Svardim, <laughs> the Svardim, they stop after the end of the fourth coast. There are no songs. After the fourth coast, it's finished. It's done. Anyway, my wife and I were alone. Usually we're preparing for 45 people to Seder. This year it was two. And only one of us eats any chicken. So, you know, it was all for me. And it's wonderful. I asked my wife after Shabbat, I said, are you ready to do this for three days running? She said, it's a good thing we like each other. And it worked out very well. And we had a delightful time. Uh, but it's like Rabbi Bronson Lairata said earlier, you get to finish earlier and you get to sleep late in the morning and everything is fine. But I tell you something, when you concocted, which I saw in Israel was the standard of going outside at 845 in the, at night and doing Manishtana together, we have a great block. On, on our street, and it was terrific. We, uh, we really did enjoy ourselves, and we, we had a great time, and we did it the next night, too. Everybody yeah. came outside, 
and we did it two nights in a row, even on the second night. I, I, I looked at Steve Kurtz, and I said, did you start the Seder yet? He said, nope. <laughs> but we did Manishana first, and it was a delight. It really was. You Rabbi, you've told us in past years that at the last meal of Pesach, you go over the stats of all the uh, food that your <laughs> guests have consumed. Yes. So I was wondering, ate, did you do that with the two of you? Yes, we did. Absolutely. <laughs> I sat down, and I... First of all, Manishkana, I let my, I told my wife she has to stand up on a chair. She did. <laughs> she was and the I youngest. Said, what's, what's your name? Mira Ella Bat Pinchas Okay, and then she did Manishkana in about four or five different languages. And uh, we got going. But it, it, you're right. It's, it's uh, one chicken, eight eggs. <laughs> Five potatoes. <laughs> Somebody asked me how much money I saved. I said, man, over three thousand dollars. And I, I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. It okay. is over three thousand dollars that I saved. So you know, next year we'll see. <laughs> um, I think, I think we've like there are a bunch of people that were that were not able to see the stream, and. And they may just be joining us now. I'm really not sure. But uh, you know what? If, if people can't see what's going on, if they're not able to see it, these are te little technical things that happen when you're doing stuff for the first time. And uh, I, guess we'll just have to, I guess we'll just have to roll with it. Maybe they'll get to see the recorded version after it's all over. But speaking of doing stuff for the first time, Rav Natan. I understand that your wife yes, is a your wife is a dietitian, <laughs> right? Yes, and and you just turned you just turned thirty. I I just turned fifty, and wow. uh, Rabbi Davis has even more experience than than I do in this. We just had our fiftieth wedding anniversary. <laughs> wow! So you could be my parents. No. Um, you, uh, hey, hey, I'll take you back in a while. <laughs> I, I was a rabbi in Richmond, Virginia. That was my rookie position. You'll find that on the rookie baseball card. Anyway, so your, your mother came in with you in tow, and she had to run to the kitchen, so she left you in my office. You were about two years old, one and a half, or I don't know what you were, and you loaded your diaper, and I, and I changed your diaper, and that was a sign of future years that things would come. It's, it's true. All and the way back, all the way back then, Avi was full of it. Oh, okay. That's correct. And <laughs> certain things have not changed, as you're well aware. When you mentioned that at Moshe's bar mitzvah, I remember yelling from the back of the room, Rabbi, that was six weeks ago, enough living in the past already. <laughs> but anyway, that's not even what I wanted to talk about. Um, Rav Natan's wife is a dietitian, and I imagine she's on you a little bit about uh, about what you eat, when you eat, where you eat. Rabbi Davis, being married to a very healthy eater, has learned all of the tricks when it comes to <laughs> getting to eat what you want when you want to eat it. And I, I, I figure, Rabbi, maybe you could share some of your wisdom with Rav Natan of, of ways that he well, can work around. Rav Natan, I don't know about you. I have a chandelier that I and there's usually at least one salami, one salami hidden in the chandelier. <laughs> so I actually have a story. I don't know if you remember this, Rabbi Davis. We were at a, a wedding. It was one of the Eisenman family weddings. Not the Eisenmans that go to our show, but the Eisenmans of North Miami Beach. And uh, it was separate seating, not just for the, for the ceremony, but also for the meal. And they put all the I happen to know, I happen to know the origin of that custom. See, there was a sagacious rub, and he, and he Wait, instituted... What custom, what custom are we talking about? Separate uh, the, seating. Uh, separate seating oh, at, a, at a suda of a wedding. And this Rav did not want his wife to see what he was eating. No. And that's, that's the origin of the custom. So that's, that's exactly where I was getting. You beat me to your own punchline. <laughs> we, um, we were sitting and wondering who the last 
Hollywood man was that was going to, there was one empty seat at our table. It was me. It was Abe Shames. It was, I don't even remember who else was around the table. And, and I see the empty seat. And then I see you, Rabbi Davis, come walking over towards us. And you get to the empty seat. And you look over at the machitza. And you look around the table and you say, I get to eat whatever I want. <laughs> so other than you going know, to a, David, uh, you, don't have you know, any, wait, 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 wait. Any, <laughs> what, uh, Ruven Cohen, who used to live in our neighborhood before he moved back to New York, he took his wife to the blind restaurant in Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. and he loved it because she couldn't see what he was eating. He <laughs> ate, he ate all the rolls in the center of the table. <laughs> that's not what that's for, is it? Is that what the experience is for? I think so. So basically, the, the advice is... It's an expensive is, way to eat what you want. I mean, you know, you got to pay to get in the museum. I don't know. Well, maybe. There's always, there's always separate vacations. However, I think the... I think the um, the the lesson here is there is no way to work around your wife unless you just manage to be someplace where she can't see you. Is that is that basically? What about the menu planning, Rabbi I mean, Davis, do you have any say in the menu? You know, you like it just seems like you have uh, virtually no input at all. No, oh, that's just not true. That's not true. Since I do all the major shopping, oh. And therefore, I have a lot to say of what's going on. My wife and I sit together for some time and create menus. And we're usually looking for what can we make with ease for 40 or 50 people. And that, it, that takes the uh, premier ideas that we have. And uh, you have to consider everything. But the workload is dominant. And of course, once my wife became a vegan some 20, over 25 years ago, uh, you know, it used to be with nine children at a Friday night meal, we'd consume several chickens. And uh, so when she became a vegan, she introduced all the vegetables. But overnight, nine children, we ate one chicken, one chicken, because all of us love vegetables and we all, we, so she didn't run up against a solid wall all the yeah. time. But uh, you know, it's it works. It works. Rav pull the pull the kid card. You have little kids. You should be like, oh, the little kids. They they like junk food. But see if, if that'll help with your life. Right. And if you're under thirty, you like a kid anyways. No, the truth is, is that it's it, it's not bad. I'm not complaining at all. It just has to be, you know, uh, the right kind of you know, with the right ingredients. So, you know, grass-fed meat is the best kind of meat, and you know, chocolate as long as it's not artificially flavored. You know. The right things with the right, you know, the right ingredients. Okay, I don't mind if my if my meat ate grass. That's fine with me. Free range, cageless chickens, right? Free range, cageless chickens. That so you can you can taste that false sense of freedom that they had. <laughs> I mean, in Portland, you know, my, you know, if you go to a restaurant in Portland, you you know they give you a whole list of who the chicken was and what was their name, their personality, their friends, their relatives. You know, you really get a sense of who the chicken was before you eat it so you know that's kind of where i'm coming from you know you really just have to appreciate the life lived of the meat that you eat you know there's so, there, there's a movement called meet your meat right meet your meat so you i was to, joking but i didn't uh, that's, that's, that's no, there is there is to get to know uh you know to get to know your chicken before an event meet your meat know the biography so um <clears throat> we're are we still talking about social distancing? Has everybody? We're talking about Pesach. Yet? We didn't talk about social distancing yet, except Manishtana, which was due to social distancing. No, I mean, I mean, as a as a people, as a people. community, are we still talking I, about I, social distancing? I maintain that we Jews don't know how to do it, but I guess we should talk about it so that we can get better because at it. I was reading some interesting minhagim when it comes to social distancing. You were supposed to say six feet apart, right? So there are some people who are who they go into the sixth foot. <laughs> and then um, Yekis, I understand, they only do three feet. And, uh, mm -hmm. and our Dutch cousins, they, one foot is enough for social distancing. Uh, are they, do the Dutch happen to be little people as well? Is well, they are, funny? yes. I think they are little. <laughs> Aren't they the herd? You know, Avi, Avi, I just want to tell you, I saw a picture of a bris in Eretz Yisrael. 
and the moil was six feet away, and he put his blade on a long stick. Yeah. There you go. That's, Did he also have a really long straw? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> I think that's what uh, Rabbi Selmar means when he says big simcha. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, and, and we have, besides the occasional happy occasion of the, of the Brit Milah, we've also had some social distancing, unfortunately, funerals that we've attended as a community. And it kind of reminds me, Rabbi Davis, of a story I heard you tell about an <laughs> okay. unveiling. Yeah, it's an unveiling. You know what I'm Actually, talking about? Yes. <laughs> there was a guy, Mr. Magid. Mr. Magid, uh, at 92 years old, I officiated his wedding. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, they, they said to me, you know, I think you should get, uh, you should get, uh, you should have the two witnesses go and accompany the couple to the hotel, which I, I didn't uh, sign on for that one. Uh, so, but then to him, he, when I was called, the, when he was 96, he died. And he had in his career five wives. And he had no children. And so, but at the, at the funeral, there were about 80 people there, all nieces and nephews of his. And um, so then a year later, I got called by the lawyer who was uh, executing the will. And she arranged for me to come to an unveiling for him. So I came to the unveiling, no nieces, no nephews, just the Jewish lawyer, woman, and two black ladies who were the, his caregivers. I guess the, uh, the once they found out what was in the will, there was no need to exercise any due <laughs> covenant for him. <laughs> so I started, I started to speak and I said that Mr. Magid was a very uh, strong-willed person. And these two black ladies go, oh yeah, oh yes he was, oh yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm not used to that. We don't do that in our synagogues mm. of uh, cheering the rabbi on or engaging him. And you know something? I found it a lot of fun. So I fed <laughs> into that. And I'm talking for about 10 minutes. And there, you know, but he was a generous, hallelujah. He was generous. Mm. And they were into this unbelievably. <laughs> so I was finished after 10 minutes. I did the kelmole. Everything's fine. The uh, lawyer uh, took a stone and put it, a, a pebble, and put it on top of the tombstone. And then she went to the car to get my check. That was very important. So by the time she came back, these two black ladies, they had collected about 25, 30 stones and were heaping them on the tombstone. And I said, ladies, I, I think you're going to weigh him down. He's okay. He's okay. <laughs> But that was very memorable. You got to see what it's like to preach. <laughs> see, I, I would have thought, it, I, I find it a little bit like heckling. I feel like you're being heckled when people like, it, it, I, I, I'm so un, not used to it. No, when, when they, it's like heckling. they're giving you a hear, hear. I guess, I don't know. Yeah, right. Amen, brother. Uh, amen. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Nathan gets it in class. I, I, I don't know. Does he get any feedback? I'm working on it. That's that's a level. That's a status. You know. Oh, the teen minion. Amen. The teen minion gives you the feedback. Yeah, right. not the hey brother, hey sister kind of you know preaching feedback. Um, walk, walk, walk with me. Walk with me. <laughs> that's right. You don't consider the conversation going on during the teen minion to be the feedback that you're looking for. It is. It's just the it's the opposite of the exciting preacher feedback. It's like ah. if the preacher was you know preaching and then it was kind of like. You know, uh, crickets, you know, that kind of, that kind of a feedback. I gotcha. And speaking of crickets, we have just been talking amongst ourselves this evening. I seriously hope we were able to record this. It I, is recorded. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm hoping because there were some technical issues with the YouTube Live. So far, we've, we've, we have, most people got to see it on Facebook Live. Uh, we seem to have... Uh, failed our people with the YouTube Live, but hopefully we'll be able to get it out there for them to see. Uh, but any final thoughts for all the people who may well, someday get to see this? I would, I would, um, I was just going to say that, you know, everything that I, 
uh, everything I do in the rabbinate, I, I learned from Rabbi Davis, being an assistant rabbi to him for over a decade. And, and I, there was always one thing that he, ha that he did that I wasn't sure if I'd be able to do. And that was uh, close shul early on, on Yom Kippur to, uh, in, in anticipation of a, of a hurricane. And, and, you know, I felt like I had to do one better. So I didn't close it on Yom Kippur. I just closed it for six weeks and counted. So, so yeah, far, yeah. Yeah, and but listen, I, I just want to remind you, first of all, that when we first solidified our relationship, I went to New York and I took you to a Yankee game. It was a big Messiris Nefesh. Uh, it really, it was, because I don't like the Yankees at all. But <laughs> I who were they playing? Who were they playing? Was a candidate of all the candidates we had. I selected, I personally selected and endorsed your candidacy to become the first assistant rabbi of the Young Israel of Hollywood Fort Lauderdale. Yes. And for one reason, you were the only candidate had had who had less hair on his head than I had. <laughs> that was that was the winning. And now I want to share with you in my investigation, why Orthodox men should cover their hair and wear a large kippah. It goes like this. When a person grows bald on the front of his head, it means he's a thinker. When he grows bald on the back of his head, it means he's sexy. When he grows bald on the front and the back of his head, it means he thinks he's sexy. <laughs> so therefore, all the Orthodox men should wear a big yarmulke. And I'm glad over the course of the years, Rabbi Weinstock, that your yarmulke has grown. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> that's right. And, and before, before we go on the subject of baseball, Rabbi Davis, there have been so many stories I've heard over the years of things that have happened to you at baseball games. Um, I don't know how risque you want to get this evening, <laughs> but there was... There was the one at the World Series game. I got one also after he's done. Okay. Oh, wait, no, wait. Okay. Rav, Natan, Rav Natan, you go first. Because Rabbi, Rabbi Davis, might, the censors might just shut us down after he's done with this. <laughs> uh, fair enough. So, uh, truth is, is I'm, not, I'm, I'm a Yankees fan, but uh, one Pesach, I went to uh, the old Shea Stadium for Mets game. They're playing the Angels. I remember it because Mo Vaughn, who's a big guy, uh, made it from – first to third on a base hit and the crowd erupted so I remember that as part of the game but one of my favorite players was Mike Piazza he was a catcher for the Mets and I made a Mike Piazza uh, sign off of a box of was whatever was at my uncle's house and I was sitting in the front of you know the grandstand I guess maybe it was like the upper deck but the very front so I'm holding up my sign and I hear chanting behind me and I couldn't make it out but all of a sudden I realized they were chanting Huggies, Huggies. And apparently I made it on the back of a uh, diaper uh, diaper box and I got a hundred <laughs> people can't find it. Um, Very good. Very good. That okay, was a positive anyway. one. Um, but at Dodger Stadium one time, I guess when I was a kid, I uh, got the beach ball at the front of the grandstands and instead of hitting it back up, I threw it over the edge and I got booze. So I uh, got both. You win some, you out of your career. Anyway, I, you know, I was privileged to attend several World Series games. One time, um, I'm with a nice doctor in our show who treated me to a World Series ticket. And he's sitting right near me. And we were in box seats right behind home plate. And, and a young couple comes to sit. And she's gonna, she has a seat next to me. And she looks at me and she says, are, are you Lubavitch? I said, no, Baruch Hashem. Uh, no, I'm not. And she says, oh, that means I can touch you. So I looked at her and I said, ma'am, if you touch me, that means we have to sleep together tonight. <laughs> well, that silenced her up. She turned all shades of purple and sat down next to me and did not say a word for three <laughs> innings. Unfortunately, the spell wore off and she started to speak after four innings after three innings so then the fourth inning she started to talk and we had a normal conversation but anyway i was in durham north carolina and uh and, and i it was 105 degrees i had a load of kids in the van we got out i was disheveled my sisters were out 
And uh, so, but I'm in the middle of the Baptist Bible Belt, and I know Southern Baptist. So this one lady comes over to me and says, um, excuse me, sir. I said, yes, ma'am. I said, oh, she says, what are those? What are those strings? So I looked at her and I said, that's Numbers 15. She says, Numbers 15? Aren't they supposed to be blue? So I was very impressed with her. And I explained the difference of opinion as to colors, blues, okay, origin of the dye. And then she said, excuse me, sir. I said, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, do y'all keep Leviticus 11? And I said, sure we do. That's Rabbi Weinstock's bar mitzvah parsha. <laughs> no, I didn't really say that. <laughs> but anyway, that's the chapter that we just read this past Shabbos and uh, about oh, kosher. Sure. I said, not a problem. She says, here in Durham, North Carolina? I said, yes, ma'am. I can go to the grocery store and I can get kosher tuna fish and rye bread and, and potato chips and lettuce, tomato, soda. We'll be fine. We'll be just fine. And I was so proud of myself that I could conduct a conversation chapter and verse with a woman. And I was also very proud of her that she didn't ask me something from Micah 5. Or <laughs> <laughs> and I preached Isaiah. on that subject. I wanted to know how many of my congregants would fare as well talking with a Bible Belt Christian woman who can quote scripture chapter and verse. So that, that, but a lot, you know, baseball is great. Baseball is wonderful. I've used baseball for many, many times. I remember the first time that I went to lobby in Congress and they assigned me two professional lawyers from Manhattan and we went to Senator Connie Mack Jr. from uh, Florida. He was a rookie senator. And the two lawyers were talking to him. We were in a conference room and, and, and it was very stilted. Nothing happened. And uh, so it was my turn to talk. And I said, um, who do you root for in baseball? He says, that is a good question. I said, the Philadelphia A's are no longer around. He says, yeah, they went to Kansas City, then to Oakland. It's too far removed. I'm going to have to become a Marlins fan. And then he opened up. We talked about Soviet jury. We talked about the Golan Heights and everything was great. And then we left and these two lawyers come over to me and they say, what was that whole thing about baseball? I said, this man, his grandfather owned okay. the Philadelphia A's, the Connie Mack Sr. He says, if you don't know who you're talking to, how can you effectively lobby them? I mean, so, so baseball is an overture that you could use many, many times over. They're almost as good as Coke bottles. We didn't even have that on the list to talk about, but right. we are... We are coming to the end. We are definitely up to final thoughts. I'm going to share my final thought based on what Rabbi da the story Rabbi Davis just told about the, the lady at the baseball game from the Bible Belt. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Lisa Barrett's is probably from the Bible Belt. That's, <laughs> okay. that's okay. my final thought. Right. How about Weinstock? How about you? Uh, I was just going to say that uh, talking about the Bible is a good plug for Project Tanakh. We have Project Tanakh online. Everyone can sign up for a section of uh, learning, and we will be making a CM on Shavuot, uh, whether uh, virtually or in person. Uh, so be a part of that communal learning uh, initiative. And I'm going to end with a joke that Jordan Ditchick will say will not make the CD. And that's a joke for my son, Eitan. And that is, how do we know that uh, God, is a big, uh, God is a big baseball fan? Because he started the, the big, Torah because he the started beginning. in the beginning. Yep. Now, yeah. Rav Nantan, how are you going to follow that? <laughs> I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> All right. Uh, but I'll tell Rav you Nantan, that Lisa Barrett, Lisa Barrett would probably be one up on the Bible Belt because if someone said Mika 5, she would be able to tell you about Mika 5. So, you know, <laughs> you know step above. That's correct. That's right. But Nathan, I just want to tell you, my youngest daughter is a nutritionist. So, which is valuable because any time that I'm stuck on a product that my wife doesn't allow or doesn't want in the house, she'll come up with a proper alternative for me. Ah, that's good. Ah, 
Well, you know, your uh, your youngest daughter and my wife are uh, longtime friends. So hopefully, she'll have a good influence on uh, my wife. And we can <laughs> get the right very product. good. Oh, All right, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. So sorry to the people that couldn't connect live, but glad you were able to watch this as a recording. And uh, have a great week. And next week at 9 p.m., hopefully live, another episode of Rabbis in Quarantine Getting Coffee. Rabbis, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Avi. Bye. Oh.